director today is Carl Goldman. Uh, Carl is deputy director of the U.S. Integrated Ocean Obs Observing System, or IOOS. Uh, since 2000, he has served in various capacities at NOAA and IOOS, including program coordinator, program analyst, division chief, and acting deputy director. Carl holds a BS in political science and an MEM, which I assume is Master's in Environmental Management, uh, from Duke University. He will discuss how the US IOOS uses data and innovative technologies to answer questions and facilitate informed responses to environmental issues. Please welcome Carl Goldman. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you today about the Integrated Ocean Observing System and what my uh, program is supposed to be doing and some of the things that we're doing to try to meet user needs at the coast and in the oceans and coasts and Great Lakes. Um, as our tagline says, eyes on the ocean, we're trying to be the eyes on our oceans, coasts and Great Lakes in terms of understanding change, understanding trends, understanding conditions and how those conditions and trends impact our, our society today. You know where we are, you know the date. So IUS is a partnership of 17 different federal agencies. We've got 11 non-federal regional associations who are also bringing in data and providing information to the public. Uh, we're doing scientific, technical, and procedural standards to establish a national system uh, of all the players that are playing in this type of space. The acron the, uh, Logos on your top left are all of the agency logos that are part of the interagency committee. The logos on the lower left are the logos of those 11 regions that are non-federal partners that are bringing in state, local, county, tribal data into the system. And we're supposed to build this national system and we're supposed to nest it into the global ocean observing system and into the geo system, the group on Earth OBS. Uh, we'd like to say we're policy neutral, stakeholder driven, and scientifically based. The mission areas of IUS are highlighted on the slide. I've bolded the letters, the words that sort of jump out at, at what we're specifically working with, climate and weather information, maritime operations, protecting people from marine hazards, providing security, understanding public health risks, understanding ecosystem services, and, and enabling sustained use of our coastal and ocean resources. So it's a big set of mission areas. We do this with federal capabilities but also that non-federal component that I mentioned. The IUS regions are doing both observing and then managing data and then turning that data into information products and services and communicating what those data mean, what those information products mean so that people can make decisions. We talk about producing and integrating and then communicating results. This is a map of where those 11 regions are based geographically Pacific region covers a huge expanse area. Alaska likes to give me grief because they've got more coastline than most of the other regions combined. Um, and we've got a, a Caribbean region that, that works down in the, um, in, the, in the Caribbean as well. And we like to say IUS is a team sport. That acronym at the top is our Interagency Ocean Observation Committee. That's established by law. The ICUS Act, the Integrated Coastal Ocean Observing Systems Act of 2009 is the law that, that is what, uh, what I'm describing when I say our law. The other acronyms on this chart are the IUS Association on the right. That's the group that works with all those 11 regional partners. And they're able to go advocate on the Hill for the capabilities and, and, and processes and information products that we're providing to the public and explain and educate the Hill on what we're doing in our program. The IUS Advisory Committee is our federal advisory committee that gives advice to the interagency committee and to the NOAA administrator in terms of how to implement IUS. And then we have an IUS office, which is housed within NOAA. So I'm wearing a NOAA pin. I'm a NOAA employee. But I'm supposed to take that hat off and be the IUS office interagency working with USGS, working with NASA, working with NSF, working with Navy. So we sit at that table and try to make it one system across all the agencies and then bring in non-federal partners as well. So some of the tools of the trade, we have a lot of work with underwater gliders. We have high frequency radar that measures surface currents along the coast. We have buoys with sensors from the bottom to the surface. We have ships that, that do surveys, ships that drop drifters. 
We have satellites that provide data that's extremely valuable for understanding everything from harmful algal blooms to sea surface height and sea surface temperature. Um, and we have shore stations, water level gauges, all those types of instruments. We also have modeling capabilities that try to convert data into information that's more rich in, it, in, in data and maybe predicting what, what, what situations are where we don't have observations. Um, for this talk, the questions were, what are your challenges? So I threw a few up here. We have legacy systems often designed to meet a specific mission need, which is good. But that may be narrow focused that is not as expansive as it could be. If you connect the one system to another system, you get a network of networks. You, 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 you build power. Um, we have lack of interoperability and common access to data. There's pockets of highly specialized observing science and data analysis. An area, for instance, animal telemetry, we've recently started trying to organize a network across the nation for all folks that are doing animal tagging work. So we've created a data assembly center for tagging data that we can do QA, QC, and common standards for understanding those data. Um, we've also got sparse data and modeling coverage in, in some geographies. In the Arctic, for instance, we have very few observations at all. So the approach to deal with these challenges, this is a slide, uh, an image from the IU Summit 2012, and it's just describing the end-to-end -end process that is a feedback loop that we try to use. We have observing, we have models, we try to understand, use those tools to meet required information, deliver that information, and then understand from decision makers how they're using the information, is it working, and how do we refine that and improve those information products in the next go-round. And so do that frequent loop back to the customers, understand what they're using and what they need, and try to improve those products and services. Don't try to look at all the images on this slide, just look at the words. These are communities of practice, so when I said specialized capabilities, the high frequency radar network is unique capability that I use fields. We have non-federal partners have deployed these radars. We have a national data management capability with QA and QC standards. We have um, prediction products that are coordinated across the scientists that work in this realm. And we provide surface current maps for all the locations where high frequency radar exists. We've got some gaps in the Gulf of Mexico, if you see the image at the top. Um, but we've got a national capability that is known to the public and is used for search and rescue, for oil spill response, for we're starting to get uh, work with the Weather Service on delivering a significant wave height product from this technology as well. I mentioned gliders. We've done a similar thing. We've taken all the operators we can get together. We've written a national plan towards implementing a national network. We've created a data assembly center for glider data so that those who are operating gliders will have a place that they can send their data so they don't have to build that capability. We have it. We can share that capability. And then the display and use of those data, we're bringing people together to analyze and figure out the best ways to use the glider data. Um, we've done similar things. The biological variables image on your right, within that interagency committee, we've been having task teams that work every couple years and then work on a project and then we move on. So we brought together scientists in the biological realm and asked, what are the specific data types that are most critical? What are the first ones that you would prioritize for us to work on in terms of integrating and making common data standards across the enterprise. And they've issued, an, a, they did a survey and a report, and that report is about to come out within the next month from the Office of Science and Technology and Policy. So we're trying to coordinate and create a common set of standards, and that's one way that we do it. We've got a WAVES plan that we refresh frequently. We wrote that in conjunction with the Army Corps and the other um, partners at the interagency level to define what are the best techniques for measuring waves in a common way across the nation. And it also lays out where we might have gaps in wave data. And we've got some specialized wave sensors called um, that are part of this Coastal Data Information Program that is the Army Corps of Engineers program. And they've got, just like those other two scenarios, a data assembly center and data management capabilities that's managed at scripts. So anybody that wants to put a wave buoy in the water can utilize that data system too. In animal telemetry, I already mentioned, we're doing the same structure there. That's our approach. Bring the experts together, design the data management techniques, create a data assembly center so you can get the data in and quality control it and then deliver it to everyone who needs it. So I heard you talk, you heard from Jeff de la Bogidier yesterday and 
IUSA is big data as well, and we're working with the big data folks and, and the companies that are in that um, big data project that you heard about yesterday are also trying to figure out, okay, what are the ocean data sets that are of interest that we can put in the cloud and we can do things with to create more useful information products for society? So access to data is a thing that we work on. It's sort of the bread and butter of what we've been doing for the last 10 years. We work on standards. We've got two different websites. We've got an, an IUS.gov website, which is our within the government fold uh, platform. But we also have IUS.us, which is where all of the open source sort of cutting edge development work is. Our regions are funded via grants, which are fun funding that's supposed to be used for the public good. So all of their products and services and data have to be available to the public. And we've created a space online where there are we, we use GitHub sites, we write Python notebooks, uh, we, we, um, we publish the standards and results, and then we also work with other groups that are setting standards in terms of on the inter international stage uh, to make things work together. We do um, a series of quality assurance, uh, real-time oceanographic data manuals, that's that image at the lower left, I mean the middle left. The lower left is uh, the global telecommunications system is a closed system and we transmit all of our meteorological data into that system. That's the system that the National Weather Service and the World Meteorological Organization uses for weather forecasting across the globe. So any of our data sets that have data of interest to that system, we route through the National Data Buoy Center, do QAQC, and get it into the national forecasts as well. Um, and then the two images on your right, up on the top right, we have a, an environmental sensor map which has a two-week rolling cache of data. We pick up the next day tomorrow and we'll drop two weeks ago, uh, we'll drop a day off. And we're carrying those two weeks of data for all in situ data that is available in open source, discoverable ways on the internet. Axiom Scientific is the company that built that product for us. They're also the back end data manager for our Alaska region, our central northern California region, and our southeastern region. So they're building capabilities with funding from our office, but then they're building more capabilities for other customers and, and serving and providing them information to meet their needs as well. On the uh, access to model output, we've used another company, um, ASA RPS, is the company that's done work with the Coast Guard to create an environmental data server that delivers them the information that they need to, to run their search and rescue optimal planning system. Built off of that platform, they have a visualization now that specializes in delivering model output and allowing you to do comparisons of real-time observation data against model output. And you can also toggle on and off different models. So you can pick, there's four different models in the Chesapeake Bay on circulation. You can go and look at what the results are in one location for any of those four different models and then compare them to real data if there's real data nearby. Um, Part of the law that we have that passed in 09 says you should figure out a way, NOAA, to offer certification to the IUS regions who are non-federal partners. For the purposes of providing data, if you certify them, it will transfer civil tort liability <coughs> protection to those non-federal entities as if they are NOAA employees. So we went about the process of doing rulemaking writing procedures with our interagency committee, and then implementing that rulemaking within NOAA. And we're now receiving applications from our IUS regions. And when they get certified, it means that they're recognized in, as, a, as a formal part of the system. They get that liability protection for the purposes of data dissemination. And it establishes criteria and establishes a data management plan. They have to have a strategic operational plan. Um, we made a system that's credible and reasonable. We have a 90-day clock to review their, their applications. If we have questions about any data that's in their application, we stop the clock until they answer those questions. So we're working through this process. We now have PAC IUS, which is the Pacific Islands, and the Great Lakes Gloss are certified. Maracuse was just approved for certification. It's just working through the final MOU. And we have applications in from Miracuse and expect them in from Al in Alaska as well already. So this is a part of the evolution of the program. It's really interesting to me because as a policy, these regions that I mentioned, it's a very interesting policy construct. You have non-federal regional partners working to meet local, regional stakeholder needs and nest that information into a national system. 
So the folks in the Mid-Atlantic are going to know the science and technical and, and environmental issues in the Mid-Atlantic the best. So we've got scientists, technicians, and um, an analyst who are reviewing the information and providing it to the customers in the Mid-Atlantic, but they're working in partnership with the Northeast region and the Southeast region and our office. So applications and needs. What do we do with this data? Why are we here? Why am I talking to you all today? There's all types of reasons. One is post-storm response recovery and long-term planning. We help in terms of informing navigation response teams. We work with the National Geodetic Survey who provides shoreline imagery before and after storms. We work with the Office of Response and Restoration that does oil spill response. Their lead modeler makes sure that they get the IUS data into their models. We work with the Marine Debris Program to understand circulation and flows, uh, where marine debris may be going. We analyze storms and try to provide new information for subsurface data in the advance of storms. We're trying to fly gliders under those storms uh, as they approach the East Coast, for instance, to get a better handle on storm intensity. Storm track's pretty well understood, but storm intensity is one of the vexing problems that we're still working on. And we work to promote resilience and best practices on the coast. We work with our coastal zone management programs and the Office for Coastal Management and they're figuring out on the lower right there how to decide best planning and green infrastructure opportunities to protect our coasts. As I mentioned before, the high frequency radar data is available for that search and rescue planning system. Um, the image on the right is, is an image from that system where when they have a notice of someone missing or someone lost in the water, they set about putting their system in place and they create a grid which tells them where their search needs to be. We're using drifters to test where do drifters go in the ocean and how is this uh, high frequency radar doing at predicting where those currents are going. I saw a presentation yesterday by one of our lead analysts in, from Rutgers and the skill assessment of the radar versus the global model for the oceans, the HICOM model, is six times better than the HICOM model at, at predicting where a drifter is going to go and therefore where a person might go if they're missing at sea. And so one of our goals is to try to expand that network to get to areas where we don't have as much spatial coverage and we're continuing to improve the products as we go. <clears throat> um, we're also trying to provide public good information. Uh, we had the Refugio State oil spill in 2015 and we put a temporary radar up near that site so they could do this. This is a particle tracking image where the surface currents are predicting where particles would go so that the response team could decide whether they should be deploying assets to the north, to the west, to the east, to the south, and where they might, might best uh, put their efforts. We're working um, in terms of providing information for public health. Um, you have satellite imagery there of, of, I think that's chlorophyll on the west coast. In the imagery on the right is, those are images of microscopic organisms that are being taken by a, an automated camera called an imaging flow cytobot which is deployed in the water, and it's running water through, through without harming the water, through two glass lenses and taking photos that are of such high quality that the guy that has, I have trouble with saying the professional name, Mike Cross, but when you're doing microscopic work and you do that for 40 years, you have a title that I can't say. The, the, the guy that's been doing that work in San Francisco Bay for 40 years was highly skeptical of this new technology and said it's not going to be, it's not going to work. And then he saw the images and he came over to visit with the principal investigator working with this and started immediately helping him identify what all of these species were because it is such clear imagery that he was amazed. And we're going to be able to automate the way you can get software to figure out how to count the different, different organisms. We could potentially set it up to give us alerts when a certain uh, species blooms at a certain level that we then could use another technology called an environmental sampling processor, which is basically a buoy with pucks in it that do in situ uh, assays to determine water quality. And there's a limited number of, of samples in each buoy. And if you've only got 30 samples in that buoy, you don't want it to be going every day if you don't need it. So we could potentially use this technology with that technology to understand where harmful algal blooms may be getting worse um, in, in situations where it could be harmful to the public. Um, and that lower imagery is that, that environmental sampling processor. Uh, and so all of that, as I said, is related to harmful algal bloom monitoring. And we're trying to figure out the best ways to do that. When I mentioned the IU certification, um, 
the, the director for the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, Mary Erickson, she's really keen on getting our IUS regions to be players within the, within the chain of events for predicting harmful algal blooms. So it takes a long time to get to understand what exactly the science and observing needs are to understand harmful algal blooms. And then there's a whole set of social science you need to do to understand how people are going to react to the information, how to provide information about risks without ruining tourism, for instance. Um, the beaches in Florida are pretty upset if we put out a harmful algal bloom forecast and it gets beachgoers to go to another beach. So you have to get that right and you have to work with local officials to get that done the right way. Our regions are positioned to do that and she thinks that the certification that the regions are getting, it's, it's making them part of the system and formalizing that relationship and that they're the key players at the coast in each region that can specialize in each harmful algal bloom type and the players that are there that need to know about the information. Um, we support fisheries. This is an image of um, a, a project that went on within Rutgers. They got fishermen to go out with them on boats. There's a problem with the, the squid fishery was getting limited by the bycatch rules. Bycatch for butterfish had a limit. They didn't want them to catch too many butterfish. They had an assessment of how many butterfish were out there. Well, the fishermen were like, you guys are crazy. We should be able to catch more squid. There's more butterfish than we could count in the oceans. You guys are wrong. Why are you limiting us by butterfish? And so Rutgers said, well, we think we're pretty good at oceanography. Why don't we get some fishermen to go with us out on a boat, and we'll do some oceanography work and figure out where, where they're sampling the butterfish for these fisheries surveys, and then we'll ask the fishermen what we should be do doing differently. And through that partnership, they figured out sampling regimes with the fishermen along gradients of temperature and salinity and started finding, guess what, a whole lot of butterfish. Fast forward a couple of years, the stock assessment for butterfish has been adjusted way up. The limit in the squid fishery is taken away. They can catch as many squid as they, much more squid now. And the butterfish fishery itself has, has bloomed so that you've got almost a $27 million per year increase in revenue that can be achieved just because we were getting the stock assessment wrong over this one species. So partnerships bringing the right expertise together and using ocean data and information can make a difference in, in our economy and in our livelihoods. And it's great to hear those fishermen talking and saying how valuable it is to work with the oceanographers. It's a, it's a good partnership that continues today. We have a similarly valuable partnership with the shellfish industry that really started on the West Coast. There's $111 million per year industry and they're at risk from ocean acidification. In 2008, the Whiskey Creek Oyster Hatchery that supplies seed to most of the hatcheries on the west coast, over 80% of the seed stock at that time was this one hatchery, they lost their entire stock of seed because of ocean, uh, ocean acidification conditions. They call it corrosive water. And we figured out it's not the prettiest technology, but up there on the right is a set of machinery and sampling tools called a Berkelator. This guy, Burke Hales, helped to invent it. And it allows very precise sampling at different locations and analysis of the partial um, carbon dioxide within the, within the water column, which they now monitor on an hourly basis. And the shellfish hatchery can turn off the water if corrosive waters are coming. They can treat their water differently if they need to do that. They can shut the, the intake off for up to a day if they're really bad conditions. And that's changing the, the bottom line for their business on a daily basis. Um, and the buoy is on there because they're asking us now, can you give us better predictive capabilities? They understand from the offshore buoy, when the winds are blowing from the north, you're going to have Coriolis effect, you're going to have pulling of the surface water off and upwelling, and that's when this, the corrosive waters usually show up. So we use the buoys offshore. They're now looking at those and saying, OK, the winds have been strong for a few days, so I may be having problems soon. So right now it's sort of look at it that way, and uh, we want to get to the point where we're predicting it more precisely. Uh, our program has a small amount of funding in research and development dollars, and we call it Ocean Te Technology Transition, and it's designed to move proven technologies from that pilot stage to operations. So you hear folks talk about the research valley of death where things never get converted to operations. We're trying to bridge that valley. and. We have a whole lot of partners working projects. That imaging flow cytobot was one of those projects. That's a picture of that in the middle there. The Berkelator is here on the left. 
we've got that environmental sampling processor on that, the middle right picture, and um, there's a nutrient uh, observing network in the northeast that we're working as well. And then we've got shark tagging work that's been going on in Hawaii for a while, really innovative work understanding where the tiger sharks are going in relation to time, and, to time of day and month and year, and they were having well, they're having a much better ability to understand where their sharks are now today, so that when there are shark attacks against humans, there are perhaps better understanding of where the sharks are in the environment and where they're feeding and what their habits are. Um, a piece of this that is, I really like is we're trying to push partnerships with private sector, academia, and government to move technologies forward. And so this is an area where there are a lot of companies working in the automated, uh, the Un, un, unmanned automated systems, your gliders, your surface drones, uh, and even your aerial drones. And those companies want to participate. They want to help. They're innovating for other purposes and other mission areas. Um, and so through this type of funding opportunity, we can create uh, more partnership opportunities to advance our technologies. Another piece of that research and development funding goes to the Alliance for Coastal Technologies. They do sensor testing and evaluation in different environments across the nation. So they'll test in the Great Lakes for freshwater. They'll do testing in Hawaii uh, for warmer tropical conditions. They'll test in the mid-Atlantic in the estuaries. So they're part of a nutrient sensor challenge, which is we created as, as much like an XPRIZE type competition as we could, but we didn't have any money to give as a prize at the other end. <laughs> So we created a market-based challenge where we said, okay, programs that would buy sensors, if we could create cheaper nutrient sensors below five to seven K per sensor, would you buy them? And we had five or six programs basically raise their hand and say yes. So that's a market signal to the vendors that if you make these sensors cheaper and available at, and providing good data, you know, these programs are willing to invest in them. So the vendors came to the table and it's been really interesting to see. We've got, I think, companies from five different nations working, and I was at the deployment into Solomon's Island uh, Chesapeake Biological Laboratory when they deployed the sensors there, and it was pretty neat to see. They were, it was kind of interesting because they're taking off-the-shelf technologies that might cost 20K now and trying to make them 5K. So rather than being this amazing set of gee whiz things you'd never seen before, they sort of had hardware store stuff that they'd purchased as cheap as possible to try to replicate the things that we're doing with sort of higher technology capabilities. Because to make something cheaper, they had to find ways to use different materials to get the same results. Um, and the final stage of that is still ongoing, and the results are expected out, I think, uh, sometime in the next six to nine months. The coastal ocean modeling test bed, it's the only coastal ocean in modeling test bed in, in NOAA. And NOAA has a series of test beds that help to advance capabilities towards operational. And we have a series of projects. One, for instance, in the Chesapeake Bay, we have a hypoxia model that the Virginia Institute of Marine Science has developed. They've worked with fishermen to understand the fishermen need is a three-day prediction. The hypoxia model happened to be set up for a three-day prediction. So they're refining their capabilities there. The mid-Atlantic region is going to deliver that capability. The expertise will reside at VIMS, and we'll provide that through a system that has known QAQC standards for data dissemination. We've also um, had a, a player in our team, Gabrielle Canonico, has been a major, um, a major proponent of this marine biodiversity observation network. And she's organized uh, a collective group of agency efforts that total 15 million over um, five years. And they're doing demonstration projects to do baseline environmental monitoring of biodiversity from the smallest microscopic DNA levels up to, up to whales. And we have most, all of the projects are associated with um, National Marine Sanctuary locations as well. So we're advancing the sanctuary's capabilities to understand and do their condition reports that they do every year. We're advancing the understanding of baseline conditions in the Arctic so that if we were ever to have a bad result of an oil spill, we have better information about what was there in the first place and what we need to restore to if we need to restore to some condition. Um, the trick with these projects is what are we going to do after FY18? There's a huge amount of energy and um, excitement about the results that we're getting in so far. I'm going to give you a slide that shows these are the topic areas and the different sort of trophic levels of analysis and information they're providing and the tools that they're using. 
Um, so we want to use this understanding of marine life to understand how it's changing and establish these long-term status and trends. And it's going to be helpful, as I said, for protecting shallow and deep, deep water corals, managing national marine sanctuaries, understanding biological impacts of ocean acidification, and understanding ecosystem services writ large. Um, so we're, we're moving forward with the projects that are funded now, and we're seeking opportunities to find folks that need this information for the long term so we can sustain the capability uh, into the future. And now finally, I'll switch to, I mentioned earlier the innovation, uh, working with private sector to innovate. Uh, a piece of understanding how to work with the private sector is understanding who the players are and what sort of capabilities exist out there. So within the weather service, there's been some work done on the weather enterprise, which is generally described as all of those companies, government, academia, that work in the space of weather prediction. Uh, Louis Uccellini, the head of the weather service, says, I don't have to pay for advertisement on TV because these companies build products and services off of weather service products and services and sell them to the television stations so you all get your weather forecast every day. We similarly have companies that are working as providers, intermediaries, and, and then there's end users for ocean information. So when we're predicting, mapping, uh, measuring the oceans, we have companies in the provider space that make the sensors, deploy those sensors, get the data back. We have companies then that do things with the data. Data managers, they do something with it, make a visualization, an information product, adding value to that. And then you have end users that are making decisions with those ocean data uh, on a daily basis, like I mentioned, those shellfish growers. So in February, we released the results of a three-year study we did to try to understand. We, we just analyzed the providers and intermediaries because uh, the end users are very hard to get to in terms of that daisy chain all the way down to what bit of data did that end user use. We really want to know that information, but for the scope of this study, we didn't have the time and resources to fund that component. I'd like to do that in the future. Um, for the providers and intermediaries, we went about trying to get a list of every company that worked in that space. We, we contacted the Marine Technology Society, all of the agencies in their interagency committee, all of the regions, and said, who are you working with? We got a set of company names up to 700. We started to review their mission statements and their websites to, to QAQC that list, and there were a lot in there that were not ocean information companies. They were perhaps a maintenance company that worked with NOAA <laughs> at a facility. So we, we combed that list and we culled it down to 410. We did a online survey where we asked a series of questions of those companies about their revenues and their activities. And the end result is of those 410 companies that are in 36 states, their annual revenues for the ocean enterprise are $7 billion per year. That's equivalent to the National Football League's revenues for the year, not the individual teams, just the league itself. Uh, it's also equivalent to the uh, green card industry's revenues for the year. So we have a real ocean enterprise, similar to the weather enterprise. It's pretty big, and it's made up of intermediaries and providers. There's the percentages there for you. And the market sectors that they work in, I put a, I put a snapshot up there for you there. Um, it's not surprising to us that we, we, we understand and know more of the provider companies, so we suspect that there are more intermediary companies that we don't know about. They often can be smaller startup type companies, so we're interested in repeating the study. We've created a space on our website for new companies that weren't in our study the first time to raise their hand and opt in, uh, and we plan to replicate this study if we can in a year or two. Um, and we take we take results from the study and talk with industry about it and try to understand more in depth how are they interacting with the IUS enterprise, what can we do together to partner and, and bring capabilities forward. Um, and often it's, it's impressive to me that the main ingredient for everything I've been talking about today is collaboration. None of this gets done without collaboration. None of us have enough funding to fund all the sensing and observing and data management we need to understand our oceans fully. So we do the best we can with the bits and pieces that we have, and then you collaborate, 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 and communicate, communicate, communicate. And I've been finding that the industry wants to collaborate as much as the government and nonprofits and the public. So we've got to figure out ways to do that to move this capability forward. <laughs>